another, and God gives us the Holy Spirit to be with us. And so may you sense that spirit of peace, of hope, of renewal, wherever you are worshiping with us this morning. Uh, if you're worshiping with us in person, we are thankful for your presence. Of course, the bulletin has the order of worship, our liturgy, um, but our songs throughout uh, this morning will either be in our red hymnal, that's what's the ELW that's in front of you or underneath those gray seats, or if you see WOV, that's the thinner blue book, and all the hymns are in the larger numbers in the back half of either the blue or the red book. So we are thankful that you're here. Let us center our hearts and our minds as we gather as God people. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Amen. Now we begin our time focusing our hearts with the time we call confession and forgiveness. If you're here in our sanctuary, you're invited to remain seated or to use those kneelers in front of you. So blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Now let's confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another. Merciful God, we confess that we have not followed your path, but have chosen our own way. Instead of putting others before ourselves, we long to take the best seat at the table. And met by those in need, we have too often passed by on the other side. Set us again on the path of life. Save us from ourselves and free us to love our neighbors. Amen. Friends, hear the good news. God does not deal with us according to our sins, but delights in granting pardon and mercy. In the name of Christ Jesus, your sins are forgiven. You are free to love as God has always loved you. Amen. As you're able, we invite you to stand as we sing our gathering hymn. grace of our risen Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and unity of the Holy Spirit be with you all.
Now, together, let us pray the prayer of the day. Eternal God, you draw near to us in Christ, and you make yourself our guest. Amid the cares of our lives, make us attentive to your presence, that we may treasure your word above all else. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Peace you. The first reading is from Genesis chapter 18, beginning at the first verse. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre. As he sat at the entrance of the tent in the heat of the day, he looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, My Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread, that you may refresh yourselves, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant. So they say, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah, and said, make ready quickly three measures of flour, knead it, and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd, and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to the servant, who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, Where is your wife Sarah? And he said, There, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season, and your wife Sarah, Sarah shall have a son. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. Psalm today is from Psalm 15, which we read responsibly. Lord, who may dwell in your tabernacle, who may abide upon your holy hill? Those who lead a blameless life and do what is right, who speak the truth in their heart. They do not slander with the tongue, they do not they do no evil to their friends. They do not cast discredit upon a neighbor. In their sight, the wicked are rejected, but they humor those who fear the Lord. They have sworn upon their health and do not take back their word. They do not give their money in hope of gain, nor do they take bribes against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be overthrown. On the paths of the Lord are steadfast love and faithfulness. To those who keep our covenant and testimonies. The second reading is from Colossians, the first chapter, beginning at the 15th verse. Christ Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For him, in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him and for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. And you who were once estranged and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his fleshly body through death, so as to present you holy and blameless and irreproachable before him, provided that you continue securely established and steadfast in the faith, without shifting from the hope promised by the gospel you have heard which has been proclaimed to every creature under heaven. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. Now I, I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's affliction for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make a word, the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages 
and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he who we, whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. <coughs> is from Luke, the 10th chapter, beginning at the 38th verse. Now, as Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary, who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. The Gospel of the Lord. So growing up uh, as a child, whenever we would go to the Forbes family side of the family tree, I was always fortunate to have lots of cousins to play with, which meant any time there was a holiday dinner when like all 30 plus of us would gather, as a child I had it easy. I would play with all my cousins, and then when it was time to eat all the great food that people had brought for Thanksgiving or Christmas or Easter, they would call us in from playing out on the farm, and we would eat dinner, and you'd have all the stuff on this great cooking and great food, and you'd get your fill. And then, especially my cousins and I that were older, we were about eight of us, so we were kind of the older ones, we were wise enough to know that we need to be out of the kitchen before everybody else was done. Because when everybody else was done, then people took responsibility on who needed to stay into the kitchen and clean. And I noticed a lot of my uncles were fast, like I was fast to go outside and play again. A lot of my uncles were fast to go back and watch football or whatever they were doing. And so growing up, it just was, was common that a lot of my aunts were in the kitchen. When I got there, I'd go play, I'd come back, they'd still be in the kitchen. Then I would finish eating, I'd go out and play, they'd still be in the kitchen. And my uncles just seemed kind of glued to the sofa in front of whatever game was on TV. I don't think my uncles were like intentional, like just forcing my aunts, their wives or family members to stay in the kitchen to cook and clean and do all these preparations and the cleanup. But, I mean, after a good meal, who wouldn't choose a nice lazy boy sofa to sit in versus cleaning the things you cooked. And even as a cousin or as a young child, you know, I thought with my cousins, it's much more fun to play after dinner than to stay cleaning up the dishes. Didn't think anything of it. It was just kind of that's what I was used to until one year, about 10, 15 years later. Uh, at that point, I was already married to Kristen. I think we even had one of our boys, so we were parents. And all of my cousins, at that point, we were older. We had all had, had children. So our 30-person family dinner became like... 40 plus, and so my aunt that was hosting it that particular year, I think it was Thanksgiving, had it at their local church. So meant that you were out in the fellowship hall, uh, and similar to our Mullen Hall, you have like the hall, and then you have a couple windows that separate the hall from the kitchen. And so then dinner would happen, and um, you know, Kristen, and I think one of our boys were there, and my cousin, Josh, who I hadn't seen for some time because he had, been, he had enlisted and had been out, uh, I think, like in Egypt or somewhere, uh, serving. And he was came, coming back. This is one of his first holidays back in a long time. And so I'd been talking to him and somehow just saw that he was in the kitchen cleaning up. And initially, my one cousin was like, <laughs> Josh didn't, uh, he, he, look at him. He's in the kitchen. We're out here just relaxing, talking. You know, we're spending time listening to one another. That's what you want. You know, it's a family reunion. A lot of us hadn't seen each other for a year, year and a half. Let's just talk. Until you all who know my wife, Kristen, look at me and she's like, Adam, you need to get in and help, help your cousin Josh. Yes, dear. So I did, but it was 
challenging, right? I thought, no big deal. It was a chance for my cousin Josh and I to catch up. You know, all of my cousins, I'm very fortunate. We were all close growing up. Uh, and so it was a chance to talk to him, what had been going on. There are a lot of things in his life between um, making through basic training and all that to then having to, you know, go a different part of the country and not see his own children, all these things. So it was a good time for us to talk. But then, if you've noticed, if you've ever been the one doing dishes or cleaning up after a, and this was a church that didn't have a dishwasher, so dishwasher. And so you're doing, I don't know if you've ever cleaned up after a big dinner, and you just feel like there's no end. Like, you feel like somebody's pranking you, and they're just pulling dishes from the cupboard, and it's just never ending. And you think you're almost done, and then my cousin Josh and I would look over, and there'd be a new stack of dirty dishes. And so after a while, you know, the, the novelty, the funness of catching up with my cousin, doing a couple dishes, joking, because we're like, oh, we were always the cousins that were outside playing, and now we're stuck in the kitchen. Ha, ha, ha. How are the kids? All this. That wore off because the dishes continued as we were done with that fun conversation to the point where I kind of remember thinking, and you could hear all the laughter. You could hear all the fun. I'm like, gosh, I, I want to be out there. You know, it's so tempting to run out and be like, Kristen, you told me to help my cousin Josh. How about you help my cousin Josh? Not the case. We think of our gospel reading today. On the surface, it's Mary and Martha, two sisters. One is listening to Jesus. And Martha is in cleaning. And if you think, if you were reminded quickly, what is this story about, then you might say, well, Martha is doing too much in the kitchen. She needs to be like Mary. Don't be like Martha. Be like Mary. But it's not quite that simple. And a teaser that Jesus doesn't reprimand Martha for being busy, but releases her from her stress. On the surface, though, it is Martha busy in the kitchen. Mary is sitting at Jesus' feet listening. And don't be like Martha, we think. Be like Mary. End of the conversation. If it were only that simple. Like my, me and my cousin Josh, I don't want to be stuck in the kitchen, I want to be out there, but somebody had to do the dishes. So I ran across some wise words from a colleague. Her name is Debbie Smith. She's a pastor of um, Lifelong Faith Formation at St. Mark's Episcopal in uh, Palo Alto, Arizona. And here's how she talks about how we can understand Martha and Mary. It's not either or, but they're kind of two different people in the same situation. She says, it poses the question, we think of the story of Martha and Mary. We are left to wrestle with this either or, right? The temptation is either or. Be like Martha or Mary. She, talks, she says, is the action or contemplation? Service or worship? Hospitality or prayer? For as long as the church has existed, we've debated these dichotomies. Which is more important? Kneeling at the, kneeling at the altar or mopping the church floors? What should we prioritize and how should we find a good balance between the mystical, the holy, and the practical? We look up here and when I lift the bread, the elements for Holy Communion, certainly that is a holy moment. I know that. When Dick read scripture this morning, it is a holy moment. Do we think of whoever shovels off the sidewalk in nine degree weather on a snowy January morning as an equally holy moment? You know, I've been in many churches that I've uh, just kind of learned from mentors. Uh, if you look in my office, um, on my de one of my chairs or table, I have the little um, statue of Jesus kneeling and washing one of his disciples' feet. And so for me, service has always been a part of my ministry. And so even as far back as when I was an intern, I remember when I picked up my plate, we had like a meal, uh, like a celebration, and I went to pick up my meal and stack up my chair because that's what they, I knew that's what they need to do. So take your plate, put it in the trash, and put your chair away. And I was young enough and able to do it, and so I went to do it. And I remember somebody was visibly surprised because they hadn't seen a pastor do that before. I'm like, certainly in seminary, they would have taught you how to clean up after yourself and throw the plate away. And, you know, I can help and do, you know, put my chair away. You know, we have so much that we know is holy in our lives. Those obvious moments, like Mary, that was obviously a holy moment for her, being able to listen to Jesus. And not just like it wasn't a Jewish tradition, but in their time of the time of history and place in the world, that it was a little surprising that Mary would just associate with a man that wasn't connected to her family. So there was some surprise that Jesus is a part of this and that Mary is at her feet. Uh, you know, a lot of times that men and women would kind of socially interact in different places, different rooms. And so Mary is kind of challenging that and Jesus supports that as Mary is listening to Jesus sitting at his feet. And certainly we know those moments when God is clear to us, just as we lift up the elements, as we read scripture. But let's not throw Martha under the bus. This isn't as simple as Martha, just don't do those things. Because we know, like shoveling the sidewalk, like the setting up of these elements Saturday morning, 
like filling paper into our copier, or those of you who stay late after the ministry is over and the groups and everyone has gone after all the jokes and stories are told, but then there are people in that holy act staying in the kitchen, washing dishes, elbow deep in suds, cleaning up. That, that is just as much a sacred act as when we break bread together. So what is it about this Martha and Mary situation? It's more than just, don't be like Martha, because we know the church actually needs Martha's, right? I mean, if we didn't have Martha, I mean, Martha is doing things that are very important in her time. They're important to her, to her family, and they're actually uh, an act of hospitality for Jesus and the other guests. You know, in Jesus' time, and it's, it's similar to today, right? If you host someone, if you have someone over, you want that party, that cookout, that celebration you're hosting to go well. Especially in Jesus' time, it was a big deal. The weddings, all these sorts of celebrations were big because if you ran out of something, if it didn't go well, if the food was cold, that didn't just reflect poorly on you. It wasn't just people didn't enjoy the party. It was so much bigger than that because then it reflected poorly on your family. So if you threw a party and you ran out of something or you burned the steak, it was going to cast the shadow over your family's name in the community. The hospitality was a huge, huge thing in Jesus' time. It wasn't just about being kind, but it reflected directly on your family, your family's identity, and even your value in your community. And even like today, right? We want to go to a place, you know, when you go to a restaurant, right? One of the things you evaluate them is how friendly they are, you know, if they, how quickly they seat you, how quickly they take your order and bring your food, you know, is the food cold or not? I don't know about you, but I've had a couple average meals that have been overcome by extremely strong and good hospitality. There's nothing like that good service. You know, when your drinks are full, when your food comes on time, someone checking in on you. That's what Martha was doing. Someone had to cook the meal, and someone, like my aunts, had to clean up after the meal. Someone had to make sure things went well so that Jesus and all the guests would have a good time, but also that they could speak well of the family afterwards. And so Martha simply being busy is not the issue. Somebody had to do those things. There's somebody that needs to work behind the scenes. You know, a couple of weeks ago when we had that really fun uh, and different unified worship service out in the gathering space when half of our electricity wasn't working, certainly that was a holy moment when I got to stand up there and, and do all the things and we got to celebrate and pray together. But there were a whole lot of people being Martha's that led up to that great Sunday, rolling up their sleeves, making sure that our fire alarms weren't going off and a whole bunch of lights weren't blinking. The story isn't about Martha or Mary, but that we need to have both. I mean, they're sisters, The same family tree, they're intimately connected. They're not just friends, they're not just good neighbors. They are sisters hosting a party, a gathering with Jesus. And so if you are like a Martha, and you like to be behind the scenes, because remember, Mary is up front with Jesus, she's in front of all the men and all the guests. So there's some of you that are outgoing, that are extroverted, they're like, I like to be mingling. You know, Mary's probably like the mingler. And some of you are like, Pastor, if you ever ask me to speak in front of someone in worship, Don't ever do that, Pastor Adam. There's some of you that are not Marys, that are not minglers, that like to be Martha, like to roll up your sleeves and do the work behind the scenes. And certainly the church thanks you for that. And so what do we do? We get to Jesus, and Martha's frustration is at a boiling point. If you notice what she does, she kind of gets Jesus in the corner, right? She kind of does what called triangulates Jesus, right? So we have Mary and Martha. And we don't know. Maybe the two sisters had a conversation at some point, and Martha said, hey, I'm going to do this part, but when the guests come, here's how we're going to serve them so it goes well. And then maybe Martha might have said to her sister, and I'm going to need your help to clean up afterwards so that we're not staying here until 1130 in the church kitchen. Maybe they had some sort of conversation. Maybe they had some sort of deal. But Martha is frustrated. Mary is mingling, hearing Jesus and all the guests. And finally, Martha's frustration gets to a boiling point. I'm kind of like where I was in that fellowship hall with my cousin Josh. I thought, gosh, why are we the only ones? I remember when it switched from being fun and this novelty of catching up and it made us look good and people want to take pictures. I never thought I'd see you guys in the kitchen. Then it shifted to why isn't anybody else helping us? We have like 40 people here, but I feel like we have 80 people worth of dishes and we're in here. Why isn't other people trading off so we can go out and be a part of all the laughter? I mean, if any of you maybe had that experience where you're doing what you need to do and you're like, you know, we need to clean up because the kitchen needs to be clean. We're having guests. We want things to go well. And then you want to do these things, but then still there's that frustration that creeps in. Like, why isn't anyone else helping? Where is my help? Am I the only one ever? Like, guys, am I the only one that sees a whole bunch of dishes in here? I can't do it all by myself. 
If you've ever felt that way, you can empathize with Martha. And so we don't know what conversation Martha and Mary had beforehand. We don't know what deal or what routine they had planned for this meal and who was going to do what. But Martha has some hard feelings towards her sister. But instead of talking to her directly, she brings Jesus into it, right? So instead of here and just the two of them talking directly, a healthy communication, she goes out to Jesus instead, which is kind of risky because then you're bringing potentially, then you're bringing your dirty laundry to like everybody. It would be like if you had that family dinner. It would be like if I came out of the fellowship hall kitchen, left my cousin Josh, and I went out there and said, everybody, you should all be ashamed of yourself. My cousin Josh and I have been in here washing dishes for eight minutes, and our hands are getting too soft, and we need someone else to help you. How dare you on Thanksgiving? How can you be thankful for anything? You're not even thankful for us doing the dishes. I think it would have been an awkward dinner for the rest of the time. So Martha risks that. She comes out, and she, instead of saying, hey, Mary, can you come here and help me? You know, can you, can, I need some help. I want to be out here too. She brings out that dirty laundry and says, Jesus, say something to my sister. But then this is the good news for Martha. It's the good news for us. On the surface, we then read in the rest of this story. It says, well, Jesus is telling Martha to not be busy and to be like Mary. Well, if you read that again, Jesus doesn't criticize Martha for preparing the meal. Jesus does not criticize Martha for being an ambitious host. Jesus does not critique Martha for wanting to keep a clean kitchen after the meal. In fact, my guess is how Jesus talks about hospitality and being a host elsewhere in the Gospels is that he probably supported what Martha was doing. That was an important act. He doesn't criticize Martha for her busyness. He doesn't reprimand her for being a doer behind the scenes, but Jesus releases her from her stress. Because remember what Jesus tells to Martha when Martha comes, you know, Jesus, you know, my sister's not helping me. I need help. You know, she's overwhelmed, and she's had it with here of no one helping her, and it pours, overflows into Jesus' lap. But Jesus doesn't say, well, Martha, you just need to stop doing things. Martha, you just need to, I mean, let that stuff go, and you need to come in here. How dare you be busy when I'm in here talking? He doesn't say anything like that. He says, Martha, you are worried with much. Mary has chosen the better part. It isn't about being busy or not being busy. We know there are Marys, there are minglers, extroverted people that are in our midst that are a part of the church, an essential part of the church. You know, the Marys are the ones that we want greeting our guests and people who come into this place for worship or other events. But then there are some of you that are equally essential to the ministry of the church that we call Martha's, and they're the ones that are rolling up your sleeves and you're staying in the kitchen until the dishes are clean, or you're shoveling off the sidewalks until they're clean, or you're making sure we have the elements up here Saturday for the next day to break bread together that this party goes well with Jesus because Martha and Mary are there. So whoever you identify with in a story, know that you are an essential part of the church. Jesus is not saying Mary is the better person, that Martha is not. But whether you are Mary and outgoing and talkative, or maybe you're a good listener, or if you're like Martha who likes to do lots of things and be behind the scenes, or maybe if you can identify with Martha because you're like, yeah, I let my stress get overwhelmed and then I just pour it out instead of just talking to the person directly. However you identify with these two sisters, the good news is the same for you, no matter who you identify with. Because we've all been in that place, whether we are a doer or a talker or a listener, where we've been controlled by our worry. I mean, who has been worried about something over the last, I don't know, month? Two years? Three years? Anybody been worried about something over the last three years? Everybody can raise your hand at this point. We keep going back in time until I get everybody, right? We've all been worried, and, and sometimes, I mean, you, if you have a, what, sleepless night, you know, and you wake up, and then suddenly, boom, all the 500 things you've been trying to forget about, you start thinking. You're worrying about all these what-ifs that are virtually impossible, but yet your brain is stuck, and then you can't go back to sleep because you're overwhelmed. You know, or you're trying to have a good time with family, but then you're worrying about something else in the back of your brain. We've all been in that place of worry, that place of stress, that place of being overwhelmed. And like Martha, it gets to a boiling point at times. You got to the point where she wasn't able to finish doing what she did, cleaning up. She wasn't able to be a part of 
the celebration or the gathering with Jesus and Mary. But Jesus, good news to her. Because he doesn't come to her. I think a lot of this is tone, right? It's not always what you say, it's how you say it. Jesus does not say, Martha, 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 stop being so busy. Get in here, be like your sister. Martha, why can't you be like your sister? She's a listener. Don't be such a doer. He doesn't say that. Imagine Jesus' voice being more compassionate, more empathetic. Martha, 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 you're overwhelmed. I can tell you have, you have so much going on. You're, you're just worried about so much. Come here, take a seat, catch your breath. The Mary is lifted up not simply because she's not doing the dishes. The Mary is lifted up not because she decided to be bold to hang out with the men, but that Mary finds peace at the feet of Jesus. As Jesus said, that's something that no one can take away. So as you continue to place yourself as a part of the church, whether you identify with Mary the listener and the mingler, or Martha the doer who sometimes gets overwhelmed, And even when we're worried, even when we're overcome with stress, may we always find our place, whether you're a doer or a listener, know there's a place for you at Jesus' feet to listen, to be renewed, to be given rest and peace, that Jesus invites you to that place that he saved for you, and that's something that nobody can take away. Amen. invite you to stand as you are able as we state the words of the faith which unite us this morning using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Together, let's state the words of the faith together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He sent into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He has seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, or if you're in our sanctuary, use the kneelers uh, in front of you as we pray for the church, the world those close to us, and those we have yet to meet. After each petition, as you hear God of grace, you're invited to respond, hear our prayer. So united in Christ and guided by God's Holy Spirit, we pray for the church, all of creation, and everyone and everything in need. Ever-present God, in Christ you fill all things. As your church gathers to hear your word, share your meal, and receive your blessing, Teach us to continue to welcome strangers as we have been welcomed by you. God of grace. O God, through Christ you created all things new. 
visible and invisible alike. Teach humankind to honor and protect all creation, including living things that remain hidden from our eyes, the air, atmosphere, molecules, and microscopic creatures all made by you. God of grace. God, through Christ, you reconcile all things. So motivate those in power to end enslavement, dehumanization, or brutality of any kind. Pray for the end of war in Ukraine, end of violence in other places around the world. We ask you continue to use leaders and us to protect and improve the lives of people around the world. God of grace. O oh God, through Christ you bring us peace. Assure all who are worried and distracted by many things of your constant presence. Soothe those suffering in mind, body, or spirit, and sustain all who are afflicted and those who serve as caregivers for them. God of grace. God, in Christ you make your word fully known. Inspire this worshiping community we call Zion to abide fully in your word as we sit at the feet of Jesus. Inspire us to radical hospitality and bless the ministry of our greeters and ushers, teachers, and Bible study leaders. God of grace. Amen. And now lift up to you prayers of our own hearts, silently or aloud. God, alongside our prayers of concern are also prayers of celebration and thankfulness. So we give you thanks for those who have accompanied us on life's journey, who have recently celebrated birthdays. We thank you for Kristen Forbes, for Lucas Racrone, Ashley Oda, Pat Herman, Cheryl Hoblin, Kent Spencer. We thank you for Tom and Ann Terry, who celebrated a recent anniversary. God of grace, God, prayer. God, you are a God of every time and place. And so in Jesus' name and filled with your Holy Spirit, we trust these spoken and unspoken prayers to you in the trust of our hearts for your holy keeping. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's respond to God's grace and generosity as we gather our offerings and our tithes.
let us pray offering prayer. God of abundance, you set before us a plentiful harvest. As we feast on your goodness, strengthen us to labor in your field and equip us to bear fruit for the good of all. In the name of Jesus, amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right our calling and our joy that we should at all times and all places give thanks and praise to Almighty God. For like your people Israel who busied themselves with worry of if they would survive life in the wilderness, you invited them to rest, to food, to relief at your feet. Through humanity who asked for healing and reconciliation with their families and communities, you sent your word made flesh in Jesus as Mary was renewed by sitting at his feet. And invited Martha to receive that same peace. As even in that same work, that same invitation to your Holy Spirit invites us today to act in hospitality, but also to be renewed, to rest at your feet, to hear your word, your invitation for us again today. And so for that ongoing invitation in our lives to receive peace from you that no one can take away, we join all those gathered in worship today and hosts of heaven in praising your name and singing their song without end. Whenever we gather as God's beloved community, we call the church as often as we can. We gather around this meal, simply a bread and cup, yet the holy mystery is Jesus' very presence in this meal. We remember that night in which he was betrayed, that gift he gave to his disciples and to all of humanity, and also through the Easter promise of a meal of hope and strength for us. But remembering that night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. Giving thanks, he broke it, gave it to them and said, take and eat, this is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. In the same way, after the meal, Jesus had given thanks. He took the cup, gave it to them, and said, Take and drink, all of you. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. As often as you drink from it, do for the remembrance of me. Trusting in the holy mystery and gift that Jesus is present in, with, and through this meal, let us pray together the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. For guests worshiping with us in person today, not only are we thankful for your presence, we want you to know you are welcome to this meal where God sends no one away hungry. And so the way we'll do that here at Zion this morning at the instruction of an usher, you'll come down to center aisle, receive a piece of bread from me, you can eat that right away, and then you'll receive either a clear cup of uh, red wine or a purple cup of juice if you prefer, and you can drink that and then dispose of the empty cups on either basket as you return down the side aisle. But no, all are welcome, there's enough for everyone at God's table. Amen. You see it.
as you're able. Be reminded these are God's gifts, the body, blood, and blessing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Are indeed God's gifts to you to strengthen and keep you now and forever. Amen. Let us pray the prayer after communion. Life-giving God, through this meal, you manage our wounds and fed us with your mercy. Now send us forth to live for us, both friend and stranger. That all may come in the middle of love. This we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. May be seated for a couple of moments for a couple of brief announcements, ways we can continue to have opportunities to uh, grow and serve together. Uh, does anyone have any announcements for the sake of the community this morning? Pete? <clears throat> So if you're worshiping with us from home this morning, um, Pete Schmidt just reminded us that next Sunday is our next planning session for the Community Festival. Remember, September 10th, um, mark that on your calendar, September 10th, Community Festival, next Sunday, uh, in between services, so around 945 in Mullen Hall. Um, we have a consistent pattern of donuts and coffee, so come on over, uh, and if you want to hear more about it, if you want to be involved, uh, you know, people keep asking, you know, why are we doing the Community Festival? Uh, and really, it is to reconnect with one another. Uh, there's been a lot going on, a lot of things. You know, we've been worried with much uh, over the last couple of years. And so it's an opportunity for us just to uh, reconnect as a congregation, um, an opportunity for you maybe to invite a friend or someone you haven't seen for a while or just a neighbor or friend. And you're like, hey, it might be more intimidating for you to ask them to come here on Sunday morning or intimidating for them to be invited to Sunday morning. Uh, but who doesn't want to come to like a festival, to a party? And so in one way, this is an opportunity for us to just invite one another uh, to say, hey, we haven't seen you in a while, or hey, uh, neighbor, you know, we're having this festival over at the church. There's something for everybody, uh, you know, free music, food, the whole deal. Um, why don't you come and have a good time? Uh, because for a lot of people, um, this is a sacred space, and for some, it can be an overwhelming space. Uh, and so the community festival, September 10th, is an opportunity for us to invite one another, for us to reconnect with our neighbors, uh, and also that maybe some people that consider this space overwhelming or intimidating uh, may find some sacred conversations and hospitality if they step foot onto our parking lot uh, because games and hot dogs and all that fun stuff is a lot less uh, intimidating. So it's a chance for us to invite. It's a chance for us to serve and reconnect. So next Sunday, planning session in between uh, services. And if you haven't been to any and you're like, hey, I think I want to try it, you don't have to have come to any. You know, stop in and I'm sure we can um, place you somewhere that works. Any other announcements for the sake of the community? Um, we are going to have games at the uh, event. And with the games, you've got to get prizes. So we thought maybe some of the congregation could go to the Brokers or whatever and get gift cards. And it's clear from, say, $10 to $25. Um, so if you'd like to go to the gift card, I'm sure we appreciate you give it to me. We don't want any time. It's not just like Any other announcements for the sake of the community this morning? All right. Well, please stand as you're able. Of course, if we missed any, there's always that announcement booklet in between your bulletins. I think it's like green or blue this week. But, um, of course, a reminder that um, we continue in our you know, two worship services schedule, but then our next unified single worship service will be that first Sunday in August. So that's starting to get closer. But uh, as we continue or conclude this time of worship and service to continue lives of service and worship, whether that be rolling up your sleeves, doing the dishes, or sitting at the feet of Jesus. May God bless you and keep you. May God give you patience and strength and peace even when you're overwhelmed. I know that wherever you go this week, it is a peace that not, cannot be taken away from you. So may God bless you and keep you. No, God walks with you. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God with us now and forever. Amen. As you're able, we sing our sending hymn.